Hello students and faculty, it's good to be with you again. Um, this is a little different than what we're used to, but this is what God's given us. So we're going to use this time and uh, just go through God's word. We're going to be in Hebrews 12, so if you want to go ahead and flip there. Hebrews 12, 15 through 24. I'm going to start verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was that of such that those who heard it begged no further word be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to a mountain, Mount Zion, and to the city of a living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the majority of angels, to the general assembly. Church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that during this time of separation that, uh, Lord, that doesn't change how we approach your word. We approach it with seriousness. And with the acknowledgement that it has the power to restore our lives and change us and sanctify us daily. So God, with that, we ask your spirit to encourage us and make this text real to us. Make it apply to us, Lord. May, may we know how it is useful to us. With that, God, I just ask for your blessing today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So I want to start off with just a simple question. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but you guys ever wanted something so bad? You're willing to do anything to get it. Well, I know when I was in sixth grade, there was a time that my brother and I were just kind of bored. And a friend of the family came over and we decided it would be funny to prank him. So we snuck out front to his truck and we was figuring out ideas. Then we realized in one of his bags that he just went shopping for were these Pillsbury Doughboy cookies. And of course, as boys, you know, we thought it'd be funny to eat them. Well, long story short, we ate all of them, and it was two packs. We didn't um, acknowledge the fact that it said they needed to be cooked. So, first off, we felt awful because, well, we just ate two whole things of cookies. But second of all, we just realized we took it one step further than a prank. We just realized that there was no way we was going to be able to get out of this without getting caught. You see, the reason I bring up this story is we treat God the same way. When we see something that we want, we disregard everything that he said he has given to us. We pursue earthly things. We don't care about what it, it might cost if we give up Christ and pursue those things. We just disregard them. So what's the big deal? I mean, really, like what's going to happen? Well, the reason we're in this text is because it provides two reasons why we should never abandon Christ. But before we even get to the first point, we're already in chapter 12, so we have to make sense of a little bit of what's happened before. So just the chapter before this, chapter 11, we see what's going on. He, the author, who's unknown, is talking about men of faith, like Moses, Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, all these men. The reason he's mentioning them before he gets to this chapter 12 is because there's one thing that they all have. It was faithfulness to the Lord. They faithfully pursued the Lord wherever they went, whatever temptation came to them, whatever hardship came about, they trusted the Lord. So that's why we're here. That explains, if you look at 15 with me, verse 15, that see to it part. That's a calling to be faithful. But a calling to what? A calling to be faithful to what? Well, that's what the author goes on to say. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. What that means is, see to it that you do not abandon Christ, abandon what we have in Christ. 
It's also talking here, this isn't an individual he's talking to. This is a church, a congregation as a whole, a group of believers. This is a calling, a, a warning that we see to it that we don't throw away Christ. See, you might know some of these people, or you might be this person, that follows God half-heartedly. They claim to be a follower of Christ, but once some temptation comes up, they disregard that and chase after it. They don't care about the cost, they just go for it, and then when they feel like it, they come back to Christ, or they think they do. See, that's why here in the text, you can see in verse 16, the author gives us an example of Esau. The reason he gives Esau as an example, if you remember him, he's the brother of Jacob. See, the reason this is a big deal is Esau was the firstborn. He had an inheritance, he had a birthright for being the firstborn of the family. This inheritance included ruling over the family once the father passed on. It means taking care of the brothers and sisters, the widows. He had responsibility. He inherited everything after the father passed. It was now his to take care of. But if you remember, like the text says in 16, he sold this birthright for a single meal. He disregarded every blessing that he was going to get from this just to pursue an earthly thing. I mean, a single meal, that sounds foolish. He gave up everything for one thing that didn't even satisfy probably to the night. Hmm. I mean, he just quickly moved on. So that's where it brings us to this first point. First point is don't abandon Christ because you will not found, find salvation. Now, that may sound a little strange, right? That we know the Lord has the power to save anyone. But that's not what the text is pointing to. The text is pointing to that it is us that will not find salvation. Not that the Lord can't give it, but because once you give up Christ, like Esau, you can't come back. There's no other thing besides Christ that gives you salvation. Because like Esau, the text says he saw it back with tears. I mean, he felt bad for himself because, you know, he, was, he lost everything he had. Kind of like my brother and me. We felt bad for ourselves and we cried because we realized we had lost the trust of my parents and our friends. But what could we do? What could Esau do? Esau gave up everything. I mean, that's what it's pointing to. If we do the same thing as Esau and give up everything Christ has given us, which is salvation, which is his purpose, we get to follow his will. If we give that up, We'll have the same fate. The only thing that comes after abandoning Christ is you being condemned to hell. That is where you'll be going. There's no way to come back to the Father. There's nothing on this world that satisfies. There's nothing on this world that we can do to bring us back to the Father. If you prefer what the world offers over what Christ offers, hell is where you're going. Hell being the place where we get punished for disregarding Christ, abandoning Christ. See, that's what we miss over, that there is a place for us to go. There is punishment. Unlike my brother and me, we just got in trouble a little bit, and I'm here, I'm fine, I made it. But if we do this giving away Christ, we won't be fine. It'll be eternity of suffering. There's no other way except through Christ. There's nothing you or me can do to earn it. We can seek it back with tears, but that's not good enough. It's not good enough. That's how this faithfulness ties in. It's faith to Christ. And what might you give up? See, the bowl of soup is not relevant to us right now. We most likely won't give up everything we have in Christ for a bowl of soup. But things that might be equated to that would be giving up Christ to pursue premarital sex, homosexual relationships, pursue of money. We might disregard Christ and say, you know what, you're not giving me enough. I'm going to what will give me satisfaction. Pursue a better job and, and disregard your calling to the Lord. I mean, you think of anything that's going to pursue, like make you pursue it instead of Christ, that's where you can insert here. If you're willing to give up anything, for Christ, that's it. That's the bowl of soup that we are struggling with, that we are selling out for. And how foolish is that? 
Those things only last for a short second. Once this life is over, we can all agree that we're going to die, whether you believe or not. That is the common thing. Everyone is going to die. And then, if you have abandoned Christ, if you have said, I follow him, and then once something comes up and you disregard him, hell is where you're going. And that leads us into the second point that the author is going to make. The second point is don't abandon Christ because Christ is superior to any good work we can do. Let's look at this. Let's look at verse 18. 18 through 21. It's a big picture here. The author is talking back and he's turning back to the Old Covenant. The reason Mount Sinai is mentioned is if you remember, Moses was on Mount Sinai when God gave the commandments to him. Ten commandments, the commandments for Israel. The reason the author is using this is because he's trying to tell these people. The audience here is turning back to those things, to the law, the law of doing good works, the law of obedience. The reason he's warning them against not doing this is you can see with how he, he explains Mount Sinai. If you want to flip to chapter 6 with me, Hebrew, go to chapter 6, the very beginning of it. And read verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance through dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying hands on, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. See, the point he's making here, he's showing them, is that the old covenant was a law that made us do things that didn't satisfy, that didn't bring us to the Lord fully. Everything, it, it placed the uh, responsibility on us. Those works. See, if you can remember, if you did one thing wrong against the Lord, and it be a very severe thing, you was put to death. It was a condemning law. If you didn't follow it fully, you were placed in a place of judgment, of wrath, instantly. It was death. He's trying to show them, we do not have to obey this old covenant. We don't have to follow it now. Why? Why do we not have to follow it? Because he moves on. In verses 22 through 24 saying we get to come to Mount Zion. What is that reference to? That's reference to Christ and the new covenant that he brought to us. That's what we have to trust in now. We get to trust in Jesus who is the creator of grace, of love and mercy, and the law and the covenant that he gives us does not condemn like the old one. That's what we have to recognize. We shouldn't abandon Christ because he gives himself fully to us. The description through 22 and 24 is showing everything that resides with Christ. We see the angels. We see the ones that have believed before us that have passed on. We see that Christ leads us to the judge of all. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. Why? Because his blood speaks better than Abel's blood. See, Abel's blood was spilled innocently, but it cried out for vengeance. Christ's blood was also spilled innocently, but it brought about redemption. That's what Christ is. He is redemption. He is the only way to be redeemed. That is why the author is making this point. Cannot abandon Christ because there's nothing better than Him. Anything in this world you try to pursue is worthless. We can see that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. I'll read it for you. It says, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not with him. If we, if we seek after those things that we want, and it, it takes us away from Christ and it makes us say, you know what? I'm going to walk away from you because I want to go over here. I want to go pursue what my heart desires. The text says that the Father's love is not with that person. Seeing this as a warning, friends. This is not something that says, if you do this, this might happen. This is a promise. If you abandon Christ, you will not find salvation. Because Christ is better. That's what we have to hold on to. Because like my brother and me, we mentioned earlier, we turned out fine. 
our wrath of our Father subsided and we earned that trust back. But that's not possible with the Heavenly Father. We cannot just merely disregard His Son who came to die for sins and follow the Lord's commands and simply come back to Him when we want. We'll seek repentance through tears, but that's not enough. It's faith, friends. Do not fall away. Do not disregard Christ. Take this as a warning. Keep this to the weak. And make sure, like it says in verse 15, see to it. See to it that not just yourself, but those around you. So we're in unity, we're a combined family in Christ if we claim Him. So if I'm going to do something that's going to make me drop Christ and walk away, you need to rebuke me out of love. Not, not just because you want to, but love. Because you know that you see what's better, that Christ is better. Don't be afraid. See to it, friends. Long to be with you, and uh, I hope you see this as an encouragement. If you have questions or want to talk about this, contact your RA, resident or advisor, Dr. Turner, Dr. Mullen, myself. Reach out. We'd love to talk to you about this. Take care.